mired in a single state recession for about three years. Now we've had some other states join them. Uh, in Maryland, they, were, they increased taxes last year, and revenue that they expected from the tax increase was not anywhere near the forecast. For instance, they increased their cigarette tax. They doubled their cigarette tax from a dollar to two dollars per pack. And, um, you know, they said this is going to raise all this revenue. Uh, the fact of the matter is, cigarette sales plummeted after they, re uh, after they increased the cigarette tax. That, my friends, is tax competition in action. People will choose, and if, they have the, if a smoker has the choice, he's going to drive 10 miles south to Virginia where the tax is 30 cents per pack instead of pay the $2 per pack. And that's the kind of competitive environment we face today and state lawmakers face today. So let me leave with, you with a couple takeaways on what Montana can do to become more competitive. And then uh, Dr. Paulson is going to share uh, some of the uh, examples and some of his great work over the years on, on how to tax for responsibility and, and uh, control budgets. Montana really today has a unique opportunity to become more competitive, regardless on how fictitious you think this, the current state surplus numbers are. Um, the fact of the matter is Montana is not hurting anywhere near what other states are going through right now. And so other states are probably at best going to be able to hold the line on taxes and be able to find budget savings. Uh, at worst, they're going to raise taxes, the taxes significantly. But at this time, there are going to be very few states that can reduce taxes in a, in a pro-growth fashion to make their states more competitive. But Montana does have an opportunity today without facing those budget constraints uh, as other states are in, in such a dire uh, way that Montana can today look at ways to become more competitive. And we really do have this opportunity today that I would encourage you to take full advantage of. Um, also, I would say a couple things to Montana is that we talked about the power of tax competition. Um, and I also wanted to talk about taxpayer protection. Is it, uh, Dr. Paulson will go into this more in the future. But having an effective tax and expenditure limitation that protects taxpayers is something that's essential to, for instance, let's say require taxpayer approval of, of tax increases is a great way to protect taxpayers. Having a super majority requirement in the legislature for tax increases is another great uh, tool. And this is maybe the single thing that has kept California from becoming a banana republic over the last uh, two decades is that they have a supermajority requirement for tax increases in California. And by and large, conservatives in the legislature have held firm and have, uh, and have protected California taxpayers. As bad as things are in California today, I, I think they would be 10 times worse if they didn't have a supermajority requirement for tax increases. And finally, there's a very innovative new proposal out um, by Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana who we talked about Governor Mark Sanford earlier being one of the best governors today. I would also add Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana to that mix. And Governor Daniels has a plan that he's going to be unveiling and he's actually going to be at our ALEC conference in December in Washington DC so I may see you, some of you may see him there. He's going to be talking about it. He has a plan that automatically sets up that if a state has is running a surplus, first of all they would have to fill a small rainy day fund. Once they've uh, filled a rainy day fund, any surplus dollars over that amount are immediately sent back to the taxpayers. And this really changes the paradigm from a big government situation where government's always growing and the taxpayers are always seeding ground to a way that when surplus dollars are in a state budget, the taxpayer automatically receives the refund. And this is similar to what Colorado was able to do so successfully. And then you have a, a situation where taxpayers have a very firm incentive to stop the ever increasing growth of government. And I think proposals like this um, are just a, a shot of fresh air into the realm of politics. We don't see many uh, in innovative new ideas like this these days, and as many times we're on the defensive. But this is one that is terrific. And if you'd like more information on it, I can put you in touch with Governor Mitch Daniels, and uh, we, we certainly could do that. Um, so at this time, my voice is just about holding out here, but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Paulson, and I appreciate all of your attention, and we can take questions when I think Dr. Paulson gets done.
as you can see, Jonathan and I have a tag team going here. He, he goes first and I go second. I want to focus on the reforms that I think Montana needs in its fiscal policies. Uh, earlier I talked about the need for priority budgeting. And at this point I want to focus on two reforms that I think are essential. One, a more effective tax and spending limit. And secondly, a low flat rate income tax. Again, I want to repeat why this is so important. Uh, Montana is like many states that rely heavily on income taxes. You experience what I call the ratchet up effect. Whenever the economy is growing with an income tax, high income taxes, uh, your revenue grows more rapidly than private income. In other words, you're growing government more rapidly than the private sector. Then when you hit a recession, you have a revenue shortfall. My God, how can we keep spending at this higher level? We need to raise taxes. We need to issue more debt. So there's this pressure to expand government from one business cycle to the next. And I think that's a good description of Montana, especially in recent years. Uh, I think Montana is poised to repeat the disaster of the last recession, where in the middle of that recession, you had a structural deficit of $150 million in your budget, uh, money that you had committed that you didn't have revenue. And that gives you pressure to raise taxes. We are entering a recession. I think despite the fact that you've had a surplus over the last year or so, I think you're going to see a revenue shortfall. I think you're going to see a structural deficit emerge once again. And again, you're going to be right, right back in this position. How do we raise taxes? How do we increase spending, sustain this higher spending? Now, many people think of Montana as a low tax state. And by some measures, Montana is a low tax state. The Tax Foundation publishes data on the total tax burden. And you combine all these different taxes and you measure that as a share of personal income. And it's true that Montana does show up as a relatively low tax state. The fatal flaw is your income tax. Montana, until the last few years, had the highest income tax rates in the country, 12%. Uh, if you, want to just, if you want to destroy growth and, and make this state not attractive for business investment and jobs, keep your income tax rate high. Now, I know that you've enacted some reforms in that, but you still have one of the highest income tax rates in the country, 7%, 6.7, I think, for, for corporations. Uh, I just completed a study for Cato this spring in which we tested this. What is the single most important deterrent to state economic growth, high income taxes. We were able to pull out the effects of high income taxes. That is the single most important thing that you need to focus on if you're going to try to make this state competitive. Now, uh, when, when you look at uh, Montana's business tax climate, one of the things you need to pay attention to is how much of that tax is borne by business. And uh, when you take a look at that, what you find is businesses in Montana pay a higher proportion of the taxes than the private sector, than, than, than uh, the personal families. So there's a very heavy tax burden on business in this state. Businesses bear a disproportionate share of the tax burden. In that sense, this is not a low tax state. You have high income taxes, and the businesses are bearing a disproportionate share of this tax burden. So uh, how can we reverse this? Well, there are two fundamental reforms that I think, in addition to priority budgeting. One is you need an effective tax and spending limit. And let me tell you why your existing tax and spending limit is a farce. It doesn't constrain anything. The existing tax and spending limit, first of all, is a statutory limit. Statutory limit your legislature can ignore or evade or simply do whatever they want to with it. Secondly, it's a limit that is tied to personal income growth. Well, that just locks in government as a share of personal income. Thirdly, it applies only to general fund spending. It applies to only a narrow share of total spending. And especially in recent years, uh, general fund spending is declining. You, most of the spending is explained by non-general fund spending. A fifth of the budget is now non-general fund spending. That's not constrained by your tax and spending limit. 